first of all, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you giving the time for this. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to be asking both you and Mo Green, like similar topics, and then I have some questions that are kind of specific for you and things that you said on the campaign trail. Um, but just to start off with, when did you decide to run for the office of state superintendent? What inspired you? Really, it was this fall that I decided that I was going to do it probably back in about September of uh, 2023. And what inspired me was the fact that I was seeing a decline in safety issues in our schools. I had been going to school board meetings for the last five years. You probably know that I actually ran for school board two years ago in Cary, and I'm very concerned with the direction of what's happening, and I did not feel like our current superintendent was addressing the issues appropriately. Was there a moment after you were unsuccessful with the school board race that you decided, yeah, I want to run for statewide office? No, actually, that was not a thought. My thought was I'm going to continue what I'm doing. I'm going to continue to go down to the General Assembly. I'm going to continue to tell people, everybody across North Carolina, how you can kind of take ownership of your child's education and how you can protect them and ensure that they're getting the sound basic education that they deserve. And so that was kind of, I was still in activist mode kind of thing. Um, and so I, I started working, I had been working as a nurse doing triage nursing, and then I started working with a friend who needed somebody because her daughter was leaving to go on maternity leave, and so they were doing um, project management, and I'm all like, I love real estate, so I ended up doing that for about a year, and a year and a half, and then it was really probably after my kids got married, because my children were married four weeks apart from each other. So that was a very busy time right after the election. And two of my children graduated, one from college and one from high school. So I really was not thinking anything politics probably throughout the first part of 2023. Um, was there a moment then that something changed? I think it was the Parental Bill of Rights in July. I was very, I was very insistent that with General Assembly and going to them and meeting with different educators or different people on the education committees and explaining as a nurse how concerning it is that in North Carolina there is no law for age of consent when you're talking about STDs, potential pregnancies, um, if someone thinks they have AIDS, if they're having a problem with drugs or alcohol, or if they have any emotional issues that they want to be addressed, in North Carolina, there's no age limit as to when you have to get a parent's permission. And to me, that was that's very concerning as a nurse. I think that if a, a student is suffering either physically or emotionally or intellectually, it impacts the whole family. And so I think that it's dangerous for us to be making our school systems be more of a counseling center or in treating kids for anything kind of in a vacuum of the school system. I think that that's detrimental to families and it's not helping our students to be able to handle those issues outside with their family. I think we need to be a great referral resource within the schools because clearly our teachers have a very clear window into a child's life, right? They're with them for so long. They know when they're seeing changes. They know when they think that something's upsetting. But I, as a nurse, think that the first call needs to be to the parents. Your opponent, Mo Green, says that the job of state superintendent is to be the chief advocacy officer for public schools. What do you think is the main role of a state superintendent? I think he's exactly right because this is not a legislative role. It's not a judicial role. And it's while it is in the executive branch, it is about advocacy. And I think what the advocacy needs to be about is that every student in North Carolina has the opportunity to get an education that is going to propel them to meet their highest potential. Um, neither you nor your opponent have held a statewide office or been a member of the General Assembly before. And state lawmakers are the ones to set education policy. So how do you plan to build the relationships you'll need to influence policy? As I said, I really have great relationships with people in the K through 12, both on the Senate side as well as the House side, the K through 12 committees that already exist. I've already spent the last six years investigating 
other laws and bringing them to our committee hearings and, and speaking at committee hearings and speaking up for the people of North Carolina to ensure that it doesn't matter what zip code you live in. Every student should have safety, they should be secure and in their classrooms, and they should be getting a sound education that's going to ensure that they can pursue careers. I also want to expand the, um, the trade and technical education. Right now we have some really great um, CTE programs that are not just, you know, pre-college classes, but they're also a lot of trades, a lot of technicals. I would like to expand how we are partnering with businesses in every one of our 100 counties and 115 districts so that every high schooler has that opportunity as a junior and senior to do work study programs, you know, internships, whatever it might be. Um, you mentioned school safety too. How would you seek to improve school safety statewide? What tools do you think schools should use? Uh, I think the first thing we really need to do is set forth kind of a code of conduct and offer it to the 115 districts along with the consequences so that at the beginning of every school year, every staff, every student and every parent knows what is expected of the students what's expected in behavior and what's expected in educational performance. Right now, there seems to be, as I'm going around the state and I'm talking, I've been talking to teachers and families for the last three and a half years, and they're very concerned that they don't feel like they have the backing of the administration. They feel like when there is chaos in the classroom, it's up to the teacher to go to the parent themselves rather than the principal kind of playing the heavy when that's necessary. I think the our principals, our administrators' number one job should be to create a culture of, of respect and civility and a peaceful learning environment where everyone is able to learn. And if there are students that aren't able to, you know, to be in the classroom because behaviorally they're not able to keep from distracting others, I think we need to help them to reach their greatest potential. And it's not good to just keep pushing them along or bringing them down to the principal's office and just letting them play a game and then sending them back to a classroom. Um, I think it's time for us to return to what is expected of our students. And quite honestly, that's why, one of the reasons why our private schools are so much more successful at educating our students, because they know, the parents know, the students know, the staff knows, this is what's expected in this classroom. And if it doesn't happen, you're not gonna be in the classroom anymore. And if you're paying out of pocket 10 and 15 and $20,000 a year, the parents are gonna be sure that their children are doing what they need to be doing in the classroom. I think we need that same backup of the, of the parents. We need that same system of civility and respect in our classrooms. And in terms of a policy proposal, are you saying bring back more suspension and expulsion as a tool? Um, and what other tools? I mean, well, I, you know, there's, um, I have a whole school safety advisory council. So, um, and one of the members of that is Annette Albright, who actually was a teacher in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools that had been attacked. And um, instead of the school supporting her after she had spent a lifetime trying to help people, she started, you know, in the in the prison system, trying to help young people to make something of their lives. And then she thought, I want to go into the schools and, and stop it before they get into the prison system, right? And instead, um, she was, you know, she was demonized for saying, you know, you need to be in your classroom. People should not be just walking in the halls and smoking and doing whatever you're doing. And if the administration had had her back and said to them, listen, you've had, there need to be warnings, right? But we also need, there are schools that have in other states that have kind of a whole behavioral help team. So when there is a child that is struggling, we need to be helping them. It's not always about punitive, right? It's about, we want to help you to manage how you are going to live in society, how you're going to handle stresses, how you're going to be a problem solver when things are difficult. And we need to be helping them. So if there's a student that, that routinely has problems, we should have them with a mentor of types that you can, that the teacher can call and say, you know, this, this young person needs somebody to take them out and just talk with them and figure out what's going on. Um, so, but I do think that there needs to be a standard that if consistently a student is preventing other 
students from learning they can't be in the classroom but that means we have to also make our alternative schools be excellent they should be all about behaviorally and you know and socially helping these children because we're not raising children we're raising adults and we want them all to be successful when they get out of school you've said before that you're really concerned with getting back to basics with reading and math how would you try to improve reading and math education um, and do you agree or disagree with the actions that the former state superintendent took to try to improve literacy by retraining teachers in phonics? Yes, I absolutely think that that's great. I think we, we definitely need phonics and um, we need to just keep building on those, you know, those um, positives that have happened in the last couple of years because are, we are moving in the right direction. It's pretty slow, but we are moving in the right direction. And I think you're right. We have we have to make our trainings for our teachers be very specific and very purposeful. So I think our trainings need to be focused on phonics, focused on old math and teaching our children math skills. I think that no student should leave elementary school until they can show mastery of reading, writing, and math. And that's not to say that's all you talk about in those first six years, kindergarten through fifth, but that has to be the focus and we should not be passing anybody on. I'd like to expand what's happening right now in K through five with the phonics program, expand it even into eighth grade because we have children that lost out on that, right? Whether it was COVID or whether it was just whole word learning that just has not shown itself to be a successful method of teaching literacy. And it sounds like you'd be in favor of, of retaining students if, if they're not at grade level. Absolutely. I think, but the other thing that we need to do is recognize that this is for their good. This is not, this is not about um, wanting to penalize children. It's not wanting to put burdens on them that they're not able to handle. If you have, and many people don't know this, but the way that a city or a community determines what size prisons they're going to need is what it's how well how what percentage of your third graders are competent in reading and math and so we're not doing them a service by just telling them they're it's fine it's fine we're just going to push you along i tell people this children in elementary school very much want to please they want to learn and they will ask questions if they don't understand something once you get into the middle school years there's kind of a, a stigma if you don't know what's going on. So you tend to be less open about not understanding something. And if you have not gotten that basis, you're not gonna be able to move on into higher levels of learning. We know that vacancies have been increasing for teaching positions in schools across the state. How would you try to address the shortage of certified teachers in North Carolina public schools? several different ways. One is I think once we bring back civility in the classroom, control of the classroom and, and administrative support, I think you're going to have teachers staying longer. The second thing that we need to do is I, I'd like to talk with the General Assembly. I've actually spoken with some of the members of the K-12 committee on the House side about how can we make reciprocity between states a reality in our licensure process so that when a teacher comes here from Tennessee or from Virginia or from New York, they don't have to jump through all these hoops and spend $3,000, $4,000 of their own money to ensure that they are a quality teacher and they can keep their license. So as a nurse, I have reciprocity with 35 other states. I could take my North Carolina nursing license and I could go to any of those states and practice under my license. I'd like to see if we could do that so that we can, you know, expand kind of the pool of, of potential teachers that we have. The other thing I'd like to do is we already have kind of a lateral entry program for people that have gotten a degree in something other than teaching to come in, but we know that they really need classroom training right? It's very different to be out in the world and working with adults than it is to kind of take your knowledge and put it into classroom um, time. So I'd like to see a three or four month program that somebody could potentially do during the summer months to get them up to speed so that they, if you have a desire to be a teacher, and let's say you are a biology major, right? And we're going to put you in as a science teacher. Let's just 
let you take this three or four month course. It's going to talk about classroom discipline. It's going to talk about, you know, writing lesson plans, testing all the stuff, you know, evaluating students' performance. Let's do that within a three or four month time frame so that then they can hit the ground running and let's give them and all of our new teachers mentors, right? So that nobody feels like they're going into this and they don't have a net to catch them. So I'd like to increase the mentoring program. I'd like to increase the, the teacher, um, the teacher um, advancement so that we have team leads and potentially have people that don't even have a classroom. They are just leading like all of the first grade teachers. So when it, this teacher needs some help with this or they need a resource or this child, you know, needs to come out to have some individual one on one time, bringing more of a team environment into our schools and not just at the grade level, but at the entire school. I think if we can change what's happening in the atmosphere of our schools and our teachers feel supported, they feel like they have the resources, they feel like they're a part of a team and they know that we are just as much about the success of our teachers as we are about our students. I think that we're going to get people to come back to teaching. We're going to get people that are going to want to come to teach, right? If you're in a high school that there's a lot of chaos and you're not getting the education that you need and you're seeing that your teachers are totally worn out because they're expected to be the teacher and the social worker and the police officer and the parent and the, you know, everything else and not just be teaching, why would you want to go into it? Well, and you, like you said, um, many of those programs do exist. There is new teacher mentoring. There is a, a pilot of advanced teaching roles in, in many school districts. Um, and there are lateral entry programs. Um, so I just wanted to note that those things do exist, but you're saying you, you would support advancing those. Yes, but they're, and they aren't in every one of our 115 districts. And to the point, um, also, I would like to talk with the people that are even teaching our teachers, right, to go into the General Assembly where they're discussing, um, you know, uh, higher education, because I've spoken with a couple of people that come from different states that are actually educating educators, and they have a very different approach to it. They have the first two years of a teaching degree that you are do that in a community college where you're getting a solid basis in phonics and, you know, um, child development and classroom management and, you know, how to teach math and, and how to teach the different levels. And then the next two years, your junior and senior year, instead of just having like a six week or an eight week teacher, you know, um, teacher's aid program or, um, you actually are in the classroom. You have a classroom inside an elementary or a middle or a high school, you take your classes part of the day and the other half of the day, it's like a work study program that we would do with juniors and seniors. In high school, you could do that with juniors and seniors in, in college so that then they feel like they get out and they've almost been two years in the classroom. They feel like they have their legs underneath them because typically they say after you've been a teacher three or four years and when you feel like you kind of hit that sweet spot of knowing what you're doing and feeling confident that, um, you know, that you can handle handle that. This is a little bit more of a philosophical question, but what do you think makes a good teacher? I think teaching is a calling and it's a, it's a lot like nursing. I think people go into teaching because they love children, because they love to see children learn, or because they absolutely love a certain subject. You know, if you're going to go into teaching in high school, it's because you're passionate about English or literature or, you know, history or whatever it might be. And I think what makes a great teacher is somebody who is compassionate and who is approachable and who delights in seeing kids reach their, you know, reach their, um, their full stride. If you were elected as state superintendent, what are some actions that you would take in the first six months? I would definitely, we're going to call for an audit. Um, and that's not just going to be for finances, but we have got, we have got to, we've got to pay our teachers more. And we need to make sure that our hard-earned tax money goes first to student needs and to classroom resources and to the boots on the ground staff that are helping to prepare our kids, the next generation of leaders. And so I think there, the other thing I wanna do is look at programs. I wanna audit program productivity. 
as I think we are really great at starting programs and we have all these big ideas that it's going to do X, Y, or Z, but we're not super great at evaluating whether or not we've actually achieved the goal of the program. So I think that if a program has been on the books and for the last five years cannot prove statistically, it has helped our students with academic achievement, character development, or career preparedness, then we need to look at getting rid of that and, and focusing on, on, on those three things specifically. I mean, do you have an example of something that you would do in the audit that isn't already being done? Um, I mean, we know like the, the auditor's office already audits the finances of the Department of Public Instruction and the General Assembly has legislated many reports that DPI has to create all of the time including program evaluations. Do you have a specific idea of something you would do that you think isn't being done? Yeah, unfortunately we have a lot of internal audits which don't end up being um, as transparent as we'd like them to be. So I'm talking about the 115 districts as well as in the Department of Public Instruction. One thing that people don't recognize is the current superintendent actually expanded directorships significantly, the number of directors in the DPI. And in my opinion, we have got to take, we have a very heavy handed administrative bureaucratic um, you know, system going on here. I'd like to streamline that. And as I said, I'd like to go back to that, maybe that zero budget and you start there and you say, okay, what are the absolute things that we need in these schools? And every school is going to be different because there are, there are schools that have a lot of needs just within the buildings, right? HVAC problems and plumbing issues and different things like that. So we need to look at that and say, we're going to start at the basics. What do we need for our, our staff and students to be safe? What do we need for them to be healthy? What do we need to promote a learning environment that's going to be beneficial to all? And what are our priorities in terms of our curriculum? We have a lot of fluff, a lot of stuff that we're talking about. I, I would be, you know, I mean, there's so much time that's spent in talking about how people feel. And I think that we need to focus on, with children especially, can we, they are, they're hungry for facts in elementary school. They're hungry to just know things, you know? And I think that we need to focus, that's why I said reading, writing, and math have to be the primary things that we're doing. I tell people, as a nurse, as an emergency room nurse, I worked in an emergency room for several years, I had to be really skilled at figuring out what is the life-threatening illness, right? What's the right life-threatening issue that I have to deal with first when someone comes up to the up to the window? I feel like we're kind of in that crisis point with element with education. We've got to find out what is the crisis point, and with the literacy rates dropping so significantly, and it's not just been from COVID. There was a there was statistics that came out a few days ago in 2003 comparing with 2023, so a 20-year span. And in that 20-year span, the demographics were divided up by race. Every single demographic of student has gone down in their competency in math and reading. And, and what was the source that you're referencing? Uh, that was from, that was collected from DPI. Okay. Yeah. Um, what criticism have you heard about yourself that you think is the most unfair or untrue? Probably that I don't, I, I want to destroy public education, that I don't care about public education, and that I'm dangerous by some way, shape, or form to the people or to the staff or to the students of North Carolina. It's completely untrue. I, as I said, I'm a nurse. I have 30 years experience. I have nine or 10 years teaching other people's children. Um, I love kids. We are foster parents. We worked with children in, in missions. And I want for everyone to get a quality education because I really believe education is what lifts whole communities out of poverty. It's what brings hope to families and to communities. And it's what's gonna prepare the next entrepreneurs, the next engineers, the next leaders of our society. And so we're doing ourselves a disservice if we're not preparing our young people to be able to compete in this global marketplace that we see ourselves in. And we're falling farther and farther behind when we're looking at the rest of the, not just the Western world. At this point, we're falling behind India. We're falling behind China um, in terms of, of academic prowess and inability 
to take the jobs that are coming even to North Carolina and our own state. So I think it's unfair. They say that I've never taught. I don't know anything about school. Well, my kids have been in public, private, and homeschool. And I, I helped out in the public schools when my kids were in public school. My daughter had an IEP and, um, you know, I get it. And, but I think that that's probably the most unfair thing because my opponent has never taught in a classroom. My opponent was placed in a position as the assistant superintendent and by his own admission, in order to take that role, they had to remove all of the prerequisites of education and administration. He was a lawyer uh, in, in, the, in the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. So that's unfair. It's also unfair to take things that are, that I had written or said out of context that are almost five years old, that I stated as a private citizen with no intentions of, you know, ever running for anything and to put that on as though that's something that is dangerous. What I see like is- Like the comments about Obama, like of calling for execution of Obama. What are you, what are you thinking of? Well, yeah, I'm saying that that was a comment thread that was stated when people said what should happen if he is found guilty of treason and it was completely hyperbolic it's, it, it was joking right in, in in response of like 200 people responding back and forth but the point of that is that's interesting that's four and a half years ago no one ever saw it no one ever tagged it no one ever said oh my word find this woman you know and 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 take her out and you know and flog her until you ran for statewide office right but here's the issue did you know that 1473 teachers were assaulted on the job last year that's dangerous and that's from a dpi report that is did you know that those are only the teachers that actually went to law enforcement and filed a complaint that's not counting the number of teachers that went to administration and the administration said, yeah, we're sorry, but you don't want to go to law enforcement with that. We're just going to sweep that under the rug. That's happening all over the state. Everywhere I go, I'm hearing from teachers and they're saying we're leaving because we don't feel safe. And when we're talking about danger, how dangerous is it to allow boys into girls' bathrooms, to allow boys into a hotel room, with girls as students? How dangerous is it to allow drugs on campus? And even here in Wake County, right down the road, we've had three children killed on campus in the last two years. That's not reported on. That's dangerous. Um, related to when you were talking about um, some of those Title IX issues, you've said in some speeches that you wanna push back on federal education reg regulations. Mm -hmm. What federal rule are you most concerned about? How would you push back? I'm really most concerned that we are telling our children that their value and that their future is limited by the color of their skin. I think we are dividing our children up and that's very damaging. It's damaging to them emotionally. It's damaging to them mentally and we need to stop doing it. Is there a, like a particular federal rule that you're thinking about though? Like I've, I've heard yeah, you it's say called that, DEI. I mean, that's not a, like, that's not a legal rule. Is that, uh, is yeah, it is actually. Um, every, you, we do not get any federal dollars if you are a school system that does not have a DEI department. And what people might not recognize when they're all wanting these federal monies in 2022, 2023, for instance, Wake County, right now the largest county in all of North Carolina, 15th largest in the country, we received $2.1 million total for our yearly budget as from federal grants. Now that's not counting ESSER funds. That was, a, you know, that was an extra thing. 1.3 million of that 2.1 million was spent just in eight DEI staff salaries. And we were forced to have a DEI department for Wake County in order to get the federal dollars. So what that means is, and that's just one, one mandated department, one mandated program, one mandated curriculum that we are told you have to have this in place in order to receive this money. 
So we are paying from our state funds and from our local funds for the mandated programs and the money coming from the federal government isn't even covering those, right? So that's why I'm saying we need a program audit. We need to figure out what is actually helping our kids academically, what is keeping our staff and students safe, what is helping to recruit and retain excellent teachers. And that has to be the primary focus of everything that we do, money and classroom time. On the campaign trail, you've also called schools indoctrination centers. I mean, it's part of your sub speech. Yep. Um, what are you worried that schools might be indoctrinating students with? And, and how do you know that? Yes. I know that they are indoctrinating our students to think that capitalism is the reason for all of the world's problems, all the world's poverty. And if we had socialism, that everyone would be better off. The fact that we are not teaching the truth about socialism and how many hundreds of millions of people have lost their lives under communism and socialism and totalitarian governments is indoctrination. If we do not tell our children the truth, I am a nurse. I know for a fact, no one can change their gender. There are two genders and telling children who have not yet gone through the process of puberty, which is the most natural and the most important part of development and growth in the human life cycle. Telling them that they could be in the wrong body before they've gone through that, before they have their whole frontal lobe at 25, is medical malpractice and it's indoctrination. And the fact that we are now being told that almost 25% of this generation under the age of 18 thinks that they might be in the wrong body. Do you think that that's happening at the dinner table? Do you have evidence or, you know, from your own experience where you believe that this is being taught in school, some of the things that you've mentioned? I know it is because when I ran for school board, um, Everybody insisted as they were screaming and yelling and spitting at me and threatening me and telling me that my children should be taken from me. This was in Cary, North Carolina. Um, they told me, you don't know what you're talking about. We're not talking to the kids about gender. We're not talking to the kids about any of this. That was in November of 2022. Fast forward to February of 2023, and there is a Senate hearing for the Parental Bill of Rights. And I stood there and talked about as a medical professional, this is the detriments. This is what's dangerous. This is why we need to protect our children and allow them to wait until adulthood, until they're fully developed to determine what they want to be and who they want to be. I'm totally when fine. The, when the state Senate was, was hearing this bill. Yes. Yes, ma'am. And the same people, some of the same people that had sat there and were angry, so angry with me, they came up to the microphone before and after I spoke and said, we are educators, we are counselors, we are social workers, whatever their job was in the school system. And they specifically said, it is our duty to protect students from abusive parents. And their definition of abusive was a parent that does not agree with their child transitioning, being called another name, or wanting to go through the process of blocking the natural process of puberty. Um, and it's okay, so that's what that's. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about like your background, your history, and your family too. We started that when we sure. when we started off. Yeah. Why did you start to homeschool your kids? How did you decide to continue to homeschool your kids? Yeah. And I'll have I have some follow ups. Too, yeah. But let's Certainly. just start with how you started and how you how you continued. Yes, really. I mean, I never I never intended to homeschool my kids. Um, my oldest child had some uh, developmental delays and learning learning differences. And so, as I told you before, we kind of walked through the whole IEP process and going to occupational therapists and physical therapists and, you know, um, and auditory processing people. And we did that, gosh, I mean, we started that even before she got into the public school. And so um, that was probably a five or six year, you know, this is your oldest endeavor. Daughter? Yes. Okay. And then she was in public school for three years. And during that time, she had 
one-on-one -on -one instruction. You know, I was going to all the meetings. I was in the classroom two and three times a week um, so that I could, you know, help and just wanted to be, you know, there as much as I could. Um, and at the end of the third year, the anxiety, her anxiety was just increasing and behaviorally, she was very stressed about school and I was not seeing any improvement. Specifically, it was math that she was really struggling with. And I kept saying, she's not getting the math facts and she's like an amazing memorizer. You know, I'm like, math facts should be good. You know, like she should be great with those. And I was told that she will just get, she'll, she'll get the math facts through what we're doing and through the word problems and stuff. And I was like, she's not getting it. And so I thought, and I said, could you just go back to like beginning math? right with her because she was having, as I said, one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutoring time for almost an hour a day. Um, and they told me at the time that they could not do that because they were preparing her for the SAT. This is in Austin, Texas. And I said, the SAT, like junior year SAT? And they said, yes, they're just saying, we're on a track. This is this is kind of the pathway we're doing. We don't do math facts anymore. And, um, and at the time we even had her in personal tutoring after school you know, trying to get that, trying to get her up to speed. And at that time, I felt like I was reteaching her everything for a couple of hours a night, like trying to get her. And I thought, what am I doing? Like, she's in school all day long. And then I'm doing this in the evening. And I have, at that time, I had three other kids and they, you know, and they had homework and, you know, and I'm helping with them. And I thought, oh my word, this is so hard. Um, and I thought, I felt like her teacher wasn't super, she didn't have a very controlled classroom. It was very much like, oh, you can, if you want to listen to music over in the corner, you know, while you're doing your reading, if you want to stand up and do this, it was kind of chaotic in the classroom. And my daughter didn't do well with that. She wasn't able to focus. And when we found out that that teacher was going to be moving up the next grade to fourth grade with everyone, yay. And I thought, oh, that's not going to be good. So I, I said, well, I'll just homeschool her for the year and I'll get her to where she needs to be and then we'll go back. So I homeschooled her for the year and then at the end of that year is actually when we moved to Colorado. So by that point, we were kind of out in the middle of nowhere and I thought, okay, well, I've homeschooled her for a year and then my boys wanted to be homeschooled because they're like, it's not fair that we have to get up and go to school and, you know, so all this. So it was kind of circumstantial. It was. It was very circumstantial at the, at the time. And as I said, when I moved back to North Carolina, I had every intention. I graduated public school, you know, in Charlotte and I was like, okay, yeah, all good. We're getting back to the land of, you know, the land of the living um, where it's going to be convenient for them to go to school. And, uh, and when I got back, we were just hearing so many stories of, of kids from the actual schools that my kids would be going to that I was very concerned. And that's when I said, well, listen, there's all these different opportunities for homeschoolers here. There's a lot of co-ops. There's a lot of sports teams. There's a lot of theater groups and musical groups. So I thought, okay, well, we'll just keep doing what we've been doing because I've been doing it for a set, for a couple of years. And when was that? What year was that that you um, moved back and you 2014. decided? 2014. Okay. 2014. And you said, so that's 10 years ago now. And then you have one son who's in middle school now. Yes. Um, is he in public school? What would And what would you... What could you do as state superintendent um, to get to a point where you would feel comfortable re-enrolling your child in a public school? Absolutely. If our schools were safe, if I was sure that it, within the classroom that the teachers had the backing of the administrators, that if someone was to get out of control and start harming other people, that there's an adult that's going to step in and bring back control. If I was sure that my son was not was going to be getting a great education and being able to not be talking about all the social and political agendas and just instead focus on, you know, facts and 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 preparing him for life, I'd be happy to put him back into the public school. And what people don't realize is the majority of homeschoolers would love to put their kids in public school. I mean, people are doing this because they feel like their child, either their child was being bullied, their child had a lot of anxiety over, you know, different circumstances in the school, and they, or they just felt like they were not learning what they needed to be learning. And they were having to, you know, offset it by, you know, or, or um, you know, add to it through paying out of pocket for, you know, different tutoring and stuff. And so um, I think if, I think 
public schools should be the absolute best option for everybody. And that's what I'm hoping to do. I'm hoping to make it be, we have had students leaving public school for years. It hasn't just been since COVID. As a matter of fact, we have been growing faster than most other states in the entire United States of America. And our enrollment in public schools has not been increasing. It's been diminishing. Let's talk about special education just a little sure. bit too. So um, I've heard that you're the mother of a child with special needs. What are you willing to share about that? Um, and how do you think that the state should best serve students with disabilities and learning differences? Well, I'll say my my daughter has a nonverbal learning disability. And so she's, I mean, she's doing awesome. But at the time when she was young, there it was a real struggle, you know, for schools, as I said, IEPs and whatnot. So, I mean, I don't consider her right now. I mean, she's married and working and, and doing great. Um, but I will say this, um, every student has incredible potential and it should be our school system's job to partner with the parents. We need to strengthen that teacher-parent uh, you know, um, connection because that really is off balance right now, in, not just in North Carolina, but around the country. And when a teacher and a student, or, or a teacher and a parent are working together, the student absolutely thrives. And so I really want to increase parental involvement in, in the whole process and parental accountability. But at the same time, I think we need to look at why are we not talking to occupational therapists and physical therapists and behavioral therapists and getting them to help give trainings to our teachers, right? Because that's what's going to help our students to be able to reach, you know, their goals. And so I am 100%, as I said, I think everyone has something to offer. I believe everybody's created in God's image. Everyone has a gift, a talent, a skill, an interest, and that's how we should be trying to individualize our teaching as much as we possibly can so that when our kids get to be seventh, eighth grade, we can look across the board and say, you know, you're really great at that. You're really great at putting things together. You're really great at sports. You're really great at math. These are different pathways that you might want to think about as a career, right? And when, if you take these classes, you might want to look at doing that internship when you're a junior or a senior, right? We need to give them a vision for where they can be. And so with our special needs students, they have untapped potential and it should be our job to work with families to figure out what is that potential and how can we draw it out of them. It's not just going to be a babysitting effort, which a lot of times it's become because you, we are very much lacking in our special special ed um, teachers. I'd also like to expand and work with the um, higher learning in our colleges so that every teacher now comes out with training in EC as well as ESL because we are only increasing the number of students that we have that have those needs in our schools. We're not diminishing them. So it would be really great if every teacher came out of and getting an education degree and felt pretty confident. I can, I can handle a, a classroom that has everybody, you know, the full spectrum of, of learning skills, whether you don't even speak English to your gifted and talented to kids with behavioral, developmental, and typical learners. And that's a policy that you would advocate for? The Absolutely. State Absolutely. I would be going to the General Assembly and saying, you know, we need to tweak what's happening in our training programs in, in the college, at the college level. We are at 4.48 right now, okay. so I, I don't know if you have time for more. I've hit all my main questions. Um, like, I have a follow-up that I could ask, but just I want to check. Yeah, with your no, time. I'm good till 5. I think I have to be on at 5.15. Okay. The other um, so I'm going to go back to something because I wasn't sure if I would have time for some follow-ups. Sure. Um, when we talked about federal education regulations and you talked about the DEI money um, yeah. that Wake County Schools receives, would you, I mean, would you advocate for school districts or the state denying federal funding for programs? If it comes with strings attached that are not helping our ch children academically, that are causing divisiveness, absolutely. And here's what pe people get scared when we say, oh, we're not going to take any money. People need to understand it's only 10% of our entire budget comes from federal funding. The rest... 
the rest of it comes. It's a, it's a little higher, but it is in that range. Well, of like when 14, you're talking about just typical grant money. Now, if okay. you're talking about ESSER funds, right, and you're yeah. going to add in all of the, the special things, yes, it probably goes up to about 16%, and, and 17%. And, yeah, it yes. But it, it's in that range. It's definitely under 20%. Yes. And and I guess the point is, um, like, for instance, people have, have said that they're concerned about how are we going to get food to our kids, right? Because um, uh, food insecurity is an issue. North Carolina, our number one, our number one um, business is farming. And I would like to see North Carolina farms be providing as much of our school lunch program as we possibly could, right? That it's going to be homegrown. It's going to be right here. It's going to be nutritionally sound and it's going to be benefiting our communities, our farming communities, as well as benefiting the students when it's not highly processed. It's not, you know, just stuff that's in a package that's frozen. Um, I think that's going to help our kids not only behaviorally, but also intellectually and athletically, um, you know, when you're talking about just health. So I think that that's why I intend to find people who are really excellent at budgeting and at numbers. I want people to understand the superintendent is not sitting home crunching numbers every evening. She's got people in the department who are working the budget. Now she's over who's going to be those people who are the directors and who are doing that. But I think a good leader finds people who are the best at what they do and allows them to do that job and kind of oversees it and gives them the platform for this is, this is the end point of where we're hoping to be. How can you get us to that goal. Yeah, the Department of Public Instruction is a really large agency. It is much too large, and in my opinion. Would you make any changes within the department? I mean, we know that State Superintendent Truett brought in, as she said, you know, folks who might not vote the same as her, might not right. be Republican. She's brought in um, researchers who used to work at NC State. Right. Um, who would you? Uh, who would you bring in, or would you? Um, make changes to staffing at the department? Well, definitely my take on this is anyone who is an expert in what they're doing and who wants our children to get a sound, basic moral education and to be able to reach their fullest potential, I'll work with you. It, I, don't, I don't think politics belongs in the classroom. I don't think it belongs in education per se. I think if we all sit down and we recognize what is our goal in the K through 12 system in North Carolina? I think we're all gonna find out we all have the same goal. We want our children to reach farther and to do better than we ever did ourselves, right? We want for them to be able to be financially independent, to have careers that are not only gonna be successful, you know, in the, in the marketplace, but also gonna be personally rewarding. We want them, if they want to, to be able to stay and raise the next generation if they wanna have a family in the same town that they grew up in. And I think education is the key to all of that. It's the key to expanding economic opportunities in all of our counties, right? Working with businesses to create a, a new generation of people who can work and take leadership of these organizations so they don't just die on the vine, right? We have so many opportunities in North Carolina. If you want to be anything, you can be it in the state of North Carolina. If you look at, you know, all of the different infrastructure and businesses that we have. And I think when we get down to it, if we kind of strip away all the political and all of the emotional, and we just say, what is our goal? Where do we want to be? When I get in, where do we want to be in four years, right? What is our target? We have to have goals. We have to have targets. We have to have things that we can measure and say, okay, this is where we all agree. This would be great if we could be here. All right. What's everybody going to do? What's your part going to be? Because it's going to take a team effort. It's not just one person. It's a whole community of people taking their expertise, taking their experience, and doing our best to do the best for the next generation. If you were elected, would you see yourself uh, running for a second term as well? Absolutely. If I if I'm doing a great job, um, really, I said I need to be implementing these safety changes, focusing on academics, and getting a grasp of where our money is actually going, expanding that um, trade and technical. Those are kind of my four 
you know, the four bullet points of what I wanted. And if I'm moving in that direction and we're making, you know, significant positive um, impact, you know, I'd, I'd love to be in there because I really believe education is the determining, the determining, um, it's going to determine our future as a state and as a nation. Okay. And those are all the questions I have and we are getting really close to five. Okay. I know you got to get to the next interview. Um, yes. Thank you so much for your time. Is there anything else that you want to emphasize? No, no. I think um, I, I just want people to know I love kids. I love North Carolina. And I really just want for every, every child to have the opportunity to be able to pursue their dreams and reach their full potential. That's why I'm doing this. I have no other hidden agenda.